Hi, this is Robert Kane, N4IXT. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the history of amateur radio licensing in the United States. I've been an amateur radio operator since 1999 and currently hold an amateur extra class license. Professionally, I'm the owner of Arcane Training and Consulting, working as a trainer in the Microsoft IT space. Check out arcanecode.com info for more information. In the very earliest days of radio, no license was required in order to operate. Operators simply picked their own call sign when they even bothered with the call sign at all. At the time, the range of an average radio was roughly 100 miles. Thus, this wasn't that big of a deal, at least in the beginning. As the technology got better, though, interference started becoming more and more of an issue. So much so that the United States Navy went to Congress demanding some type of action be taken in order to reduce interference. The Radio Act of 1912 was passed, introducing the first attempt to organize the airwaves. The management of the radio spectrum was initially handled by the Department of Commerce. This image depicts an amateur radio operator license from 1921. Initially, there were two license classes, amateur first grade and amateur second grade. To receive an amateur first grade license, you had to go to a Department of Commerce office and take a written test, plus a five word per minute code test. In 1919, this was upgraded to 10 words per minute. In the early 1900s, travel was still difficult for many Americans. Unlike today, very few households owned a car. Even for those who did, the average national speed limit was 25 miles an hour. The Department of Commerce recognized that not everyone could simply hop in a car and drive down to a Department of Commerce office. Thus, they created the amateur second grade license. In order to qualify, you had to live over 125 miles from a testing center. You would then simply self-certify that you can meet the requirements for a first grade operator. The operating privileges for both licenses was identical and both expired in five years. The only difference was the manner in which they received their license. When World War I began in 1914, amateur radio operators in the United States were forbidden from communicating with countries at war, which pretty much meant all of Europe. Hams contented themselves with communicating with each other, mostly in the U.S., when the United States entered the war in 1917, all amateur radio licenses were suspended. Hams were ordered to take down their antennas and box up their radios. Many amateur radio operators assisted in the war effort. They operated radios in the military, for the government stateside, or for various emergency services groups. All stateside operation was closely managed by the government. After the war ended in 1918, hams assumed they would be getting back on the air quickly. During the war, control of the radio airwaves was transferred to the U.S. Navy. After the war, the Secretary of the Navy made it quite clear he had no intention of returning those airwaves back to amateur radio operators. This is where we owe a great debt of gratitude to the Amateur Radio Relay League. This group began a letter-writing campaign, as well as generating a public outcry, to have the frequencies restored. In addition, they began a lobbying campaign in Congress. As a result, in 1919, Congress passed an act ordering the Secretary of the Navy to restore all operating rights to amateurs immediately. For a brief time, there was an interest in operating on wavelengths longer than 200 meters. Existing licenses did not allow operating on those frequencies. Thus, in 1923, the Department of Commerce created a new license to allow people to operate on frequencies above 200 meters. But what to call it? Since the top-level class at the time was amateur first grade, to go up from there, you had to get extra first class. Thus, it was officially named amateur extra first class. This is where the title of Amateur Extra that many of us have on our licenses today originated. On the slide, you can see an example of an Amateur Extra first grade license from 1932. 
In order to have qualified for an amateur extra first grade license, the applicant must have held an amateur first grade license for two or more years. They must have passed a written test as well as a 20 word per minute code test. This new license provided Morse code privileges to wavelengths longer than 200 meters. Very quickly though, interest shifted to wavelengths shorter than 200 meters. In 1926, only six of these licenses were issued. Thus, new licenses were discontinued in 1927, although existing licenses, such as the one to the left, could still be renewed. The next change to amateur radio occurred with the Radio Act of 1927. This act created a new federal radio division which now had authority over the radio spectrum. The new radio division, though, was still managed by the Department of Commerce. As part of this act, amateur first grade was renamed to simply amateur class. Amateur second grade was renamed to temporary amateur. Additionally, the temporary amateur license now expired in one year, and after 1932, it could not be renewed. In 1932, Congress created the Federal Radio Commission. This new commission existed as an entity independent from the Department of Commerce. What had been Department of Commerce Radio Division was now merged into the new Federal Radio Commission. At the bottom, you'll see an enlargement of the license from two slides ago. This license was a renewal that was issued in 1932. At that time, the new Federal Radio Commission had not yet had time to print out new forms. Although it's a little hard to see, you'll note that somebody has marked out Department of Commerce Radio Division with blue ink, and above it typed in the words Federal Radio Division. In 1933, the new Federal Radio Commission created three new license classes, A, B, and C. Anyone who had held an amateur extra first grade license automatically became a Class A license. Amateur operators were given a Class B license. To get a new Class B license, an applicant had to go to a Federal Radio Commission office and take the exam. Class C licenses were for people who lived more than 125 miles from an FRC office. These exams were given by existing amateur radio operators who held either a Class A or a Class B license. Here you can see the initial genesis of the Volunteer Examiner Program. Because the temporary amateur licenses had expired in 1932, anyone who had held that license simply had to retest. All three license classes required code tests. Initially, this was set at 10 words per minute. In 1936, it was boosted to 13 words per minute. A Class A license granted exclusive phone privileges on 20 and 75 meters. The license required one year of previous experience plus a written exam. For Class B and C, there were also written tests. They had no phone privileges, but otherwise had the same permissions as a Class A license. At this point, another change took place. Previously, radio operator and radio station licenses were two different licenses. At this point, they became the same license just as it is today. In 1934, the Federal Radio Commission was renamed the Federal Communications Commission. As far as the amateur radio community was concerned, there were no other changes that occurred as a result of this new name. On this slide is an example of an FCC-issued license from 1939. At the outbreak of World War II, the FCC officially canceled all amateur radio licenses, as you can see from the official notice on the left. Many amateur radio operators served in civilian roles for various civil defense organizations. Additionally, many joined the armed forces serving as radio operators. It is estimated that more than half the licensed radio operators volunteered to serve in some capacity during World War II. After the war ended, the FCC quickly began to reissue licenses. Although no changes occurred to the ABC license structure, as a result of post-war negotiations between countries, 
some changes to the pre-war frequency permissions did occur at this time. The next great shakeup occurred in 1951. The previous license classes of A, B, and C were retired. These were replaced by new classes, many of which would sound familiar today. Novice, Technician, General, Conditional, Advanced, and Amateur Extra. With the exception of novice, licenses were issued for a period of five years. Novices held an expiration date of one year. The novice license required a five-word per minute code test plus a written test. Initially, the license was valid for a period of one year. In 1964, this was extended to two years. In 1978, this period was extended to five years, the same as the other licenses. Novices were limited to 75 watts maximum power. They had Morse code privileges on 80, 40, and 15 meters. They received both code and voice privileges on the 145 to 147 megahertz band. The technician class required a five word per minute code test. In addition, they took the general class written exam. This granted them the same permissions as a general class in the 50 megahertz band. They also received both voice and code privileges in the 145 to 147 megahertz band. Finally, they had all rights above 220 megahertz. Interestingly, until the late 1960s, a ham radio operator could actually hold two licenses. They could hold both the technician and the novice and have two different call signs. The general class required a 13 word per minute code test as well as a written test. This granted them full privileges on all bands. All Class B operators became generals. All Class C operators were granted the conditional license. New Class C applicants also took a 13 word per minute code test plus the general exam. However, the test was administered by another general class or higher ham radio operator instead of going to the FCC office. In addition, the FCC reduced the distance requirement from 125 to 75 miles. While travel was certainly easier in 1951 than it had been in 1921, it could still be problematic. Most families only owned at most a single vehicle, and with the exception of large cities, most of the population was still fairly well spread out. A conditional license granted full privileges on all bands. In addition, this marked the unofficial beginning of volunteer examiners. Class A operators were placed into the advanced class. New advanced class licenses were not issued from 1951 to 1967. The only way to get an advanced license was to have been migrated from a class A. After 1967, an operator could upgrade from general to advanced by taking a written test. The advanced license granted full privileges on all bands. To become an amateur extra, a 20 word per minute code test was required plus a written exam. Amateur extras had full privileges on all bands. The next big change to amateur radio occurred in 1964 with the move to incentive licensing. Prior to 1964, general, conditional, advanced, and amateur extra all had the exact same rights on all the bands. The advanced and amateur extra licenses were essentially nothing more than bragging rights. As a result, the majority of ham stopped once they got either their general or conditional license. The FCC wanted to encourage hams to evolve their skills to the higher class levels, thus the move to incentive licensing. This did require the removal of some privileges from the general, conditional, and advanced classes who understandably weren't happy about it. By 1967, the FCC decided the requirement to take your exam at an FCC office was no longer an impediment to getting your license. Thus, they retired the conditional license, and upon renewal, an existing conditional license holder became a general. 
The next change to amateur radio licensing did not occur for 23 years. The technician license was revamped in 1990. The biggest change was the removal of the Morse code requirement. This is the very first license since licensing began in 1912 to not require a Morse code test. A technician was granted all modes and bands above 50 MHz. In addition, if the technician passed any code test, they were granted the same HF privileges that a novice had. This did cause some confusion, as if a technician was operating in the novice bands, there was no easy way to identify that they had indeed passed their code test. In 1994, the FCC started labeling these as Technician Plus in order to reduce confusion. Fast forward a decade to the restructuring of the year 2000. The FCC reduced the number of license classes to three, Tech, General, and Extra. Existing Advanced, Tech Plus, and Novice licenses could still be renewed, but were not being issued. Additionally, only one Morse code test was now required. To get a general class license, an applicant only needed to take a five word per minute code test. The restructuring also allowed for an advanced class to be able to administer a general class exam. Prior to 1987, a technician needed to take a general exam plus the five word per minute code test. Thus, any pre-1987 technician could now become a general class just by filling out some paperwork. Novice licenses, whether current or expired, could be used as credit toward the five word per minute requirement. In 2006, the FCC made their next big change, an event many operators at the time called the end of Morse code. In the year 2003, the International Telecommunications Union removed the requirement to demonstrate Morse code proficiency in order to operate on frequencies that were below 30 megahertz. The ITU is the organization that sets rules for radio operations between countries. In 2006, the FCC dropped the Morse code test requirement, becoming effective on February 23, 2007. On that date, all technicians became Tech Plus automatically. Despite cries at the time this would kill Morse code, it still remains a popular mode today. This brings us up to the present day. Only three license classes are currently being issued, Technician, General, and Amateur Extra. Existing novice or advanced licenses can be renewed. Finally, all licenses only require a written test. There is no more Morse code testing required. On this slide, I have provided links to some of the resources that were used in building this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at n4ixt at outlook.com or contact me via Twitter at n4ixt. This presentation can be found on my GitHub site. You'll find links to GitHub plus my other training materials on my information page, http colon slash slash info. Thanks for watching and 73s.